Schaltfand. International coverage of the crisis in Ukraine is focused to a large extent on geopolitical or even military aspects. But in fact, what we're seeing on the ground is an unfolding and increasingly serious humanitarian crisis. We're joined today by Jörn Ziegler of Child Fund Deutschland, who's been in Ukraine this week, checking out the situation on the ground. Jörn, thank you for joining us. Good Welcome. morning. Uh, could you begin by telling us a little bit about your trip here, what your findings have been, what your impressions have been? Sure. Child Fund Deutschland is uh, involved in uh, supporting activities in Ukraine since nearly 15 years, but our cooperation with various uh, local organizations uh, got a new dimension since last year, since the present crisis started. Uh, the purpose of my travel was to get a deeper impression and a deeper understanding of what is happening and what the perspectives for this new year 2015 uh, might be. Uh, and based on this, develop a concept together with our Ukrainian partners what could be done to help have you been surprised by the scale of the crisis that's unfolding here? Uh, I have been in various ways, I have to admit. Uh, you knew basic information, you knew figures, but if these figures uh, get a face uh, and if you become aware of the fact that only part of the internally displaced persons are registered, for example, and a major part is not yet even registered, uh, and if you talk to these people and hear their individual fates, uh, uh, then the whole situation gets a complete different dimension for you. Now, you are, your, your work is largely funded by donors uh, and contributors. Uh, how important are perceptions about the crisis in Ukraine internationally and in Germany in particular in order for you to be able to raise the funding that you need to do, to do your work? Uh, extremely important. Uh, it is our experience, which is not only happening in the case of Ukraine, it's a general experience uh, that people tend uh, to be less generous and to give less money if they have the impression and the perception that the conflict is man-made and even if the perception is that the conflict is a civil war, uh, the preparedness to give money is very low because people do not have understanding for this. When you say man-made, you mean self-inflicted essentially? Uh, exactly, yeah. And this is unfortunately a perception which is still widespread in Germany. People believe this is a conflict between Ukrainians and Ukrainians and many in the public have not yet understood to which degree this conflict is fueled and steered and undertaken by the outside. Hmm. By which you mean Russia obviously. Exactly. Um, now to what extent do you think that's a product of the the information battle, so to speak, that's been going on across Europe and particularly in Germany? It is, uh, I would say it has two sources. One sort is uh, an unfortunate disinterest in the situation of Ukraine, which was a reality for many years and decades in the German public. Uh, and based on this today, uh, we make this experience, uh, well, I would call it even propaganda or disinformation, because you have on many levels in the German uh, media and the German uh, public events, uh, this influence and this uh, attempt uh, to draw a wrong picture of the situation here. We observed this um, since early last year. It started more or less in parallel with the events on Maidan and uh, with the uh, um, military activities on Crimea. Uh, and since then it has not uh, ceased. It is even intensifying to my observation. So this is kind of a conflict uh, which is not a Ukrainian conflict any longer. It's European conflict in my opinion. People have to become aware of this. And it is a conflict which is only not, not only carried out militarily, uh, it is carried out on another political dimension also. Uh, you say it's been going on noticeably for the past year. How have perceptions changed amongst the German public over that period? Uh, unfortunately, I have to say that perceptions may start to change only now and they start changing only slowly. And they do not start as a result of more information or deeper understanding. Uh, they simply start out of the observation uh, what's happening in the southeast, uh, that no peace can be established because conflict and violence and war uh, is fueled from the east. Uh, so that gives people stuff to think whether their previous perception was right. But before this really has an impact uh, and changes the public opinion in general, we will still have to wait a long time, I'm afraid. And to go back to the issue of the humanitarian situation yep. and, and, and the victims of, yep. of, the, of the crisis, uh, where do you see the, the, the key priorities lying, both in your work and in general, in terms of the international aid efforts that Ukraine is going to need? Yeah. Uh, with regard to the immediate humanitarian needs, I would see a number of different categories, uh, in a way, geographically. You have the war zone itself, 
I have not been there. I only heard stories from people who escaped that war zone. So in a way, this is first priority. But uh, what could be done is only establish peace, which is a vision for the time being, but unfortunately not reality. Uh, the second priority would be a kind of a belt immediately west and northwest uh, of the war zone, uh, where normal infrastructure doesn't work anymore, where trucks do not want to go, uh, and where people are suffering. So institutions like the Red Cross have a major duty here to do something. NGOs, um, less powerful than the Red Cross, like we, do not have much of an opportunity to do something directly. We could only do something in cooperation with the Red Cross. Uh, then I see a second belt, which geographically perhaps goes from the region from uh, Kharkiv to the south, touching Dnipropetrovsk, uh, going to Saporozhye. In these oblasts, uh, you have the biggest number of internally displaced people. Uh, my understanding and perception is that the biggest international help coming from foreign governments is addressing this region and the many people in this region. This is good, but there is also an overstretching of capacities in this region, uh, according to what I hear. Uh, so this is something one would have to look into. <coughs> and then we have a fourth category, and these are those internally displaced people who run to many other places in central and western Ukraine. Uh, it doesn't mean that they need less support, uh, but as I was able to observe, for example, in the city of Lutsk, there is a lot of support being given both by the municipality and by many volunteers uh, who help in this uh, situation and do an incredible uh, job. So there's always something which could be done more, uh, but if you want to address the situation, you have to structure it in this way. Uh, the volunteer movement has been <coughs> one of the key factors in the last yeah. year. It's been a very striking dimension of the crisis that yeah. Ukrainian, ordinary Ukrainian people have have stepped up and volunteered yeah. across the board. Will you be making one of that one of the focuses of your aid spot to support the volunteers that already exist, the networks that have, established, have emerged in the past year? And let me say first, this, uh, this role and dimension of volunteer activity here was probably my biggest learning during this visit, because this was something which had not reached me as an information having been in Germany or other Western European countries before. So this is something I learned only here, and I'm really impressed by what I saw. I also became aware of the fact that many of these volunteers are getting exhausted these days because they are doing incredible work mm -hmm. for a year or more already. Uh, and in view of the future, this has to be considered. People cannot continue on that energy level uh, forever. Um, this is just an observation I would like uh, to share. Uh, to answer your question, yes, definitely, together with our Ukrainian partner organizations, uh, these volunteers play an important role, will play an important role, will be partners. They do already now, for example, a network of uh, psychologists uh, who got active in the Maidan uh, days, um, they are ready to be partners now in doing something for psychological support for children, youth and other IDPs. Uh, if we look beyond the immediate crisis towards the, the intermediate yeah. period, uh, I know your organization has uh, extensive experience in Africa in, yeah. in post-conflict post zones. Um, what's going to be the key humanitarian support from outside that can come in that can help the country avoid a long-term psychological scar of a generation basically brought up in, in an environment of war and, and carrying this hatred forward? Again, I would say there are three responses to this, or three categories of a response. Um, one is that West European uh, or other North American uh, governments, whoever can do it, uh, but governments and intergovernmental organizations should keep up uh, a broad support for internally displaced people right now. Uh, perhaps more than has been done in view of capacity building, uh, because even if there's support, if there's not enough capacity on the ground, you're running into difficulties. Uh, this is one thing. NGOs like us and others who are willing uh, together with their donors to support um, activities in Ukraine, I think there are enough niches which are not covered by the big uh, wave of uh, uh, support, like for example psychological support uh, for children among the IDPs. This is where we want to have one of our uh, focus uh, on. Mm. And the third one, and this is a learning here, uh, again, which I did not have in my mind before I came, I think the international community in general has to, th has to think about a much stronger and much broader attempt to support this country. This mixture of challenges you have here, war, humanitarian crisis, the pressure for internal reforms, political expectations, we're still emerging from the Maidan movement, all these expectations and pressures uh, um, 
I think the country is overstretched with all these challenges and if you do not establish a much broader international support for cooperation, nobody wants to dictate something to Ukraine, but ways can be found to do that in partnership, uh, then I think the way will be a very hard one and only partly successful. Um, so w we are a medium-sized organization. I'm an individual person. I do not have much of a chance uh, to propagate uh, this idea. Uh, but I think the political discussion in our country should go into that direction because it is simply essential, not only for Ukraine, it will be essential for Europe. Well, you've been involved in Ukraine for a number of years prior to this current yeah. crisis. And clearly there were, there were a large number of social issues uh, yeah. the country was facing before now. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's realistic for Ukraine? You know, I think we could say, I think we could honestly say it's not realistic for Ukraine to be able to cope with these on their own, um, given the scale of the crises they're facing yeah. now. Is there international will, political will, on the top level? Are you feeling to to deal with this appropriately? Um, I'm. My observation would be that there is a slowly growing will to recognize this, maybe not out of the motivation to help Ukrainians, but to protect peace and stability in the rest of Europe. Okay. If you analyze the situation of this country as it is now, as I just described it, um, you can imagine that if the country is not successful uh, in dealing with these challenges, uh, that you will have many more refugees and that you will have many more uh, humanitarian challenges and political challenges in the years to come. Uh, and as soon as Europeans realize that, I think that will give them motivation to do something more. Um, it is a pity that motivation has to go that way and through this curve, uh, uh, but better it takes that way than it does not happen at all. However, I do not know how fast that is going to happen. Hmm. You're going to be back in Germany now in the next yep. few days. Um, yep. What's going to be the key message you take back to you and how are you going to attempt to put that across to the, to the broader public and to the decision-making uh, echelons? The, um, the key, well, there, I'm still digesting a very intensive week um, and I'm structuring what we can do formally as a child and youth support organization and there we have a number of ideas which were developed together with our Ukrainian partner organizations and with the information collected here I'm quite confident that I will be able to better address uh, our donors uh, to give more and hopefully that will work and then we can help more uh, children and youth in need. On the other side, I'm thinking as an individual person, uh, as an adult European, if, if I may uh, say so, whether I can do something uh, individually through all the contacts I have to raise awareness of the broadness and the deepness uh, of the challenge uh, in Ukraine. Um, uh, and by next week I should be ready to write some letters, do some phone calls, invite for some meetings uh, as long as I can do that, uh, even if it is just in a private capacity. Well, Mr. Yeah. Liga, we wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you again Thank for you. joining us. Good um, luck in Ukraine. Thank you. This has been mm -hmm. Bjorn Ziegler with Peter Dickinson in the Ukraine Today newsroom. Uh, now back to the culture news. Child Fund.